we talking about movies? Phantom Planet. I'm sorry about that. I thought I might be calling you earlier, but, you know, I always let the interviews flow. Oh, no, that's, that's fine. That's fine. Phantom Planet. I must say, I watched this movie last night for the first time in well over 40 years, and I loved it. <laughs> it is a, it's a cheap science fiction movie. The special effects are, by and large, laughable. But it, for me, it worked. And uh, I, I think your audience is in for some real enjoyment. It is one of what I call the Time Machine clones. Remember the time machine, both the novel and, and the movie version? Yep. Uh, a traveler goes through time, basically finds a world in distress, helps them out of it, and comes back and tells his story. And that has given rise to no end of, of science fiction movies. Usually, they're space travelers, not time travelers, who go to some world where miraculously speak, people speak English, and the atmosphere is all right, and gravity is all right. And they, but they find a world in distress, and they set it straight. And I, I made a little list here. There's, there's, these, are, these are all from the 1950s, except the Phantom Planet. Missile to the Moon, Cat Women of the Moon, Fire Maidens from Outer Space, World Without End, uh, Queen of uh, Outer Space. Love it. Uh, yeah, I mean, they're all, they're all schlocky movies. Uh, Missile to the Moon has almost zero budget. World Without End is a, is a much better budget, but they're all schlocky movies, and all of them have space travelers or time travelers, or some, in some cases both, who, uh, who land on the planet, and it's kind of like a Planet of the Apes thing. You know, they, they wind up in this world, but uh, this is a world in distress, usually a world populated by very beautiful women, by the way. And, um, and oh, I can add to that list, Abbott and Costello goes to Mars, because in in, despite the title, they actually don't get to Mars, they get to Venus. How come they never go to Jupiter and then the gravity's so great? Like you said, the, you know, the gravity. Uh, well, I, 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 well I, don't, I don't know why they don't go to Jupiter. Uh, there is a, a journey to the seventh planet where they went to Uranus. I don't know if any moves or anybody went to Jupiter. Uh, by Jupiter, I mean, just, it, it is mind-boggling. But, you know, they were just entertaining us. That's right. And, uh, plus, you can get away with those days. I mean... You know, I, I get uh, the educated person knew that, that, well, actually, when I was a kid, very little was known about Venus because of those clouds. It wasn't until they could get their their sensors through the clouds that they found out it was poisonous and hot and a very unpleasant place. And uh, But, you know, the man on the street would accept, you know, he wouldn't right away throw up his hands and say that the gravity of the atmosphere uh, just doesn't work. And, by the way, how come all these people are speaking English? <laughs> and, uh, how do we not know that they don't have a little, you know, transparent bubble like the um, cone of silence, get smart, where they could actually live under the gas? Maybe. And actually, this movie tonight gets into the, 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 uh, the, the astronaut says, you speak, you speak English, and the guy goes, no, we're, we're actually communicating another way, but you hear it as English. So they get around it that way. That's very clever. Yeah. In tonight's movie, uh, the star is Dean Fredericks, uh, who... I, you know, I was watching it, and I said, I, I've seen that face so many times that I couldn't place it, and actually I could, I could place it two places. He was in Steve Canyon in a two-year TV series I used to watch as a kid. And he's a very handsome man, very high, well-chiseled cheekbones. So even though he's blonde, he would don a dark wig and play Indians a lot of the time, uh, excuse me, Native Americans, in a lot of TV series. So he was, uh, he, he'll, if people think he's familiar but can't quite place him, they've probably seen him playing a Native American. If they're old enough, they might remember him as Steve Canyon. Steve Canyon? Steve Canyon. He will, well, maybe I'm too, maybe you're too young to remember who Steve Canyon was. He was a, he was a comic strip hero, a fighter pilot, etc. And then he had, he was, his comic strip was turned into a TV series in the late 1950s for two seasons, uh, one, one or two seasons, and then it, then it went off, so it didn't have enough for really a rerun life. So you either, either saw it then or you didn't see it, though. I understand it is out on, on video now. And another actor in there is Anthony Dexter, who was a Valentino lookalike. So he, he, his first movie, or I think it was his second movie, was a starring role for him as a biopic of Valentino. And then he never really did, did much big time again, but he appeared in a lot of lower, lower budget movies, and this is one of them. And then there's a star from the silent screen, Francis X. Bushman, who my grandmother remembered quite well. She spoke of him. And he was a has-been by 1920, I <laughs> So, so he was really in the, early, in the early part of the business, and uh, the only time you'll ever see him in a in a decent in a 
good size role today as he is the villain in the silent Ben-Hur. Uh, if you remember the, the talking Ben-Hur with Charlton Heston, Stephen Boyd was the villain. That's the one I know. Yeah, he's, he played Stephen Boyd's uh, role in a silent movie made 1926, which was a big hit. And there's a famous still of him during the chariot race fighting, you know, slashing the whip on, uh, on uh, uh, Ben-Hur. I didn't know there was a silent Ben-Hur. Uh, there was a silent almost anything. It was a big, big hit. And, uh, and I, uh, I, I guess I've seen it, but I hate to say anything. It's probably been 30 years since I've seen it. So I won't, I won't say, say anything about it. I, the chariot scene was good, though. I remember that chariot scene was really good. Not, uh, you know, there's the one in the 19, what was the year, 1960 version of Ben Hur, 5960. That was stunning. That's one of the greatest sequences in, uh, in the history of the cinema. But I, I have fond memories of uh, the silent Ben Hur, but I haven't seen it for so long. So Phantom so Planet I, is how long? Do you know how long the film is? I believe it's uh, 120 minutes. No, oh. it's, uh, no, no, it's less than that. It's uh, uh, it's uh, 110 minutes, 100, 100 minutes, 110 minutes, something like that. Almost two hours. No, 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 no. Wait, I, I've got, I'm thinking of a different movie I watched the other night. It is it is more like 70 or 80 minutes. Yeah, All right, yeah. About 80 minutes, the time you expect from a programmer. Yeah. It, maybe, maybe closer to 70. So it's not a long movie. Do you think these are the... Uh, the original prints not cut up too badly? Uh, well, I don't know what print you have. Uh, and on all these public domain movies, you have to be, you know, you get what you pay for, and sometimes the DVD you're buying in the store is actually a copy of a copy of a copy of so-and-so, so-and-so. The print I watched last night was okay. I don't know what you have. You could easily have a better one. I doubt you have a worse one. So, uh, but that that's... That is a, uh, that's a problem in all these. I, I watched a silent movie today, an old Battle of Lugosi movie from 1925, about the only silent movie he had a really big role in. And the print I saw was miserable. So I hope that's not the only print left. And uh, I was uh, at Wakefield TV, which is a town, a couple of towns over. And I rejoined so they could air my show again. And they had two big screens in the, in the lobby. And one had like a, a um, fuzzy public domain movie, and the other screen had a pristine Andy Griffith show. And the station manager told me the first two years of Andy Griffith are available public domain. All right, so, so uh, we can I'm do our. Kenny Thomas let that happen because he was he was the money behind that, but they're in the public domain. First two seasons, and it was crisp and clear. So uh, she did say, you know, go out to the stores and try to get them rather than downloading them. So we're going to try to do that with Andy Griffith, and you and I can have an Andy Griffith special, our tribute. Very good. I, you know, Andy Griffith died, what, uh, in the past month, I guess. Yeah. And they were showing some of the, the uh, Andy Griffith show, and I, and I really hadn't watched, I, I'd seen lots of his movies in the recent years, but I really haven't watched his show for a long time, and it was really quite good. And, of course, Barney Fife, uh, Don Knotts, is one of the great, great supporting characters of the history of television. And... Uh, and then, you know, you, you, you forget how much hair Ron Howard used to have. So, uh, no, I, I, I look forward to that. I hope you do it. Yeah, it would be fun. And, you, you know, um, we just want to keep presenting great movies here. And, and it's, it's awesome of Frank to call in and give us his insight on these films. Phantom Planet is tomorrow night. We have about a minute and a half left. Okay, do we know what next week's movie is? No, but we will. Um, okay. And Have you seen the new Batman? Yes, I have. What do you think? Um, to me, the Catwoman should have been the, the, the uh, villainous. I could not agree with you more. I, I, I was not looking forward to Anne Hathaway as the Catwoman, but I thought she did a very, very good job. I didn't think she had that kind of performance in her. And you know, if they had su sustained her instead of Bane, the movie would have a lot more life. Yes. I, I'll be honest, I did not like the movie. I thought Bane got kind of boring. Yep, he did. And, and I thought the, the movie was the movie is very long, and I, I thought a you know pardon the pun a cat and mouse game or a bat and mouse game between Batman and the, and Catwoman would have been great, and I thought there was good. That's what I wrote. You're right. Or, yeah, I think there was great chemistry between the two of them. And I like Joseph Goodwin Levitt from The Juror. He was 15 in The Juror with Demi Moore, and now he's like 31, and maybe he's the next Robin. Yeah, I was one. Yeah, they, they make that. Are they, have you heard anything about them picking up the franchise with Robin movies? 
Ten seconds left. Justice League of America might film in Boston with Joseph Goodwin Levitt. That's the rumor. Okay, Frank, thanks a lot, man. Thank you. Bye-bye.